Good morning. Uh, it's Sunday, September 27th. This is Sunday School. We are in the book of Genesis. We are starting the 12th chapter. In the book of Genesis so far, um, God has dealt with groups. Last week, we were studying the Tower of Babel and um, all the nations that came from that dispersion. And now he's going to be dealing with an individual. Um, so he is solving a problem by choosing Abraham. He's solving a problem. And the first 12 chapters of, the first 11 chapters of Genesis are there to show us here's the problem, people, and here's why I solved it this way. So, uh, here's the first problem God is solving. God has limited himself to choice. To choice, to choosing. He's given us that power. God could make us do whatever he wants, but he wants us always to choose to do what he wants. So he's limited himself. He could make us if he wanted to, but he says, I'm going to have you choose. Uh, like when the children of Israel came out of Egypt and through the prophet Moses, God says to them, I've set before you blessing and cursing. I've said, if you do this, you'll be blessed. If you do this, you'll be cursed. I've set before you life and death. I've said, if you do this, you'll live. If you do this, you'll die. Choose life. But he can't make them. And that's what God is always, that's, that's what God's saying to us today. You can do it my way. You can do it your way. Choose my way, because my way is going to work. So, so God's limited himself to choice. Uh, started in the Garden of Eden. And, and again, all of this, God's like the master teacher, right? And I'll explain that in a second. But in the Garden of Eden, he says to Adam and Eve, these are all the wonderful blessings I have for you. Here's a thousand trees. You can have any one of them. One. I got to give you that one. I've got to point out that one so that you have a choice. You can either do it my way or you could do it not my way and suffer the consequences. So, of course, some with us, I mean, I wonder what would happen if I don't do it God's way. So, so uh, God's purpose is to entice us to follow him, to coerce us to follow him. In fact, the Bible says some save with fear to scare us into following him. Not because he just wants followers, but because his is the only way that will work. I, I'm the follow the instructions people when you get something from Ikea or I don't want to do it. My, I'm like, what does the instruction say? Because <laughs> that's the only way it's going to work. And uh, God is saying, you can do it your way, but it's not going to work. So he is, he spins the Bible, uh, I don't want to say figuring out ways, but using various methods to entice us into following after him because he knows, again, not because he's lonely or oh, I wish I had followers, I want a bunch of likes, but because <laughs> our way will destroy us and his way gives us life. So because he loves us, he wants us to like, I love you. That's why I want you to do it this way. Uh, a parent is saying to their child of three years old, you must take my hand when we cross the street because I love you. And you don't understand cars and that they will hit you and kill you. You don't even know what kill means. So I'm going to ask you to take my hand. I'm going to ooh, take my hand. But if you don't, I'm going to snatch you up. <laughs> but I, I need you to take my hand uh, because otherwise you'll be dead. And, and God's kind of saying that to us. And so uh, every action he takes is to get us to see that his way is the only way. Again, sometimes it's a loving, oh, come on, do it. And sometimes, hey, you better do it. But either way, we ultimately have to choose. And, and so he can't, he, he's not going to make us. He has decided he has limited himself in one area, and that's choice. So um, the first thing he does is like your teacher should have done is saying, here are all the wonderful things that will happen if you study. 
and if you take this class and you you'll be able to do this and that whether it's medicine or art or law or what you know here's here's all that i have for you uh but you have to choose to study then uh, and so that was the garden of eden noah and the flood was all about so here are the consequences and and i would have to do that uh in my humanities class which was my favorite class sorry it was my favorite class um because it was a history class it was the study of world history as told through the art we've produced from the cavemen on forward loved it so uh, I would first would show them different art. Here's all the fantastic art we're going to be going over and going through. All you have to do is study and you'll be an artist like these people. Then I had to give them the first test they passed because I would always say, you know, the first test is easy, but don't think that all the tests are that way. Because if you, you got to study for the, the, the second chapter, the first chapter is just the introduction. Second chapter is going to be hard. And, and I had to fail a whole bunch of people on that test so they could see consequences. That's what that was Noah. That's what, what Noah was all about. These are the consequences for not following me. And sometimes God has to do that way. And hopefully that will encourage. Some people don't care about consequences, which is what's fascinating. I don't care. I might, but you might go to jail if you do that. I don't care. Uh, so uh, the third way is confusion. Uh, your way won't work. Your way, I, what God does is he makes sure that we are frustrated when we try to do it our way. That it doesn't quite come to, why isn't this working? Because God didn't tell you to do that. He didn't tell you to do it at that time. And he didn't tell you to do it in that way. And plus, that's not even what he wants you to do. So that's why it's not working. And so that was, that's what the Tower of Babel was about. Oh, you think you can build a tower too? No, let me just confuse all of that and see that. And again, man had the choice with Cain to, uh, I'm going to just go from the presence of the Lord and act like there isn't a God. That's what came, that's what led to, <laughs> to Noah and the flood, is there was a whole group of people acting like God didn't even exist. Uh, and, and the world was exceedingly wicked, it says, and, and every thought that man thought was just wickedness continually, because that's how we are when we just act like there's no God. Uh, at the Tower of Babel, they said, we'll just construct our own gods. And, and starting from Nimrod on, when you study archaeology, when you study, we study the history of the world, starting from that on, men just decided, I don't like this God, I'll make my own God. And that's what we do today. Uh, I'll just invent my own gods that tell me what to do. I'll write my own books. I'll just, you know. uh, so uh, God says, well, let me show you what happens if you follow after your own gods. Finally, he 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 did what so so that and that's what a good teacher will do first entice you here's all the great things that you can learn if you study here's the consequences here's a test i'm gonna give you and so this fail that's what happens if you don't study uh then if you try to do it your way you'll be confused and you you won't find it working out and why okay but the final way is to Bring, and we, this is what we are susceptible to today is testimonials. Bring in someone who's taken the course. So this person is just like you. He's just exactly like you. And he sat there where you sat and he took the course and he followed what I said. And now he's a world famous doctor or now he's a lawyer at the Supreme Court or now he's an astronaut or, you know, uh, now this person's on Broadway. And that would usually, like, you know, if I invited back an alumni, this here's, here's an alumni, and he's, he's working or she's working on Broadway. Ooh, ooh you know, and, and now you think, oh, I can do that too then. That now that's, and that's God's final incentive. Let me find someone who I can shape and mold and show everyone, this is what happens when you follow after me. And that's what's about to happen in chapter 12. So we've been studying all these people groups, but now God is saying, I'm going to find an example. I'm going to find an example of what it means to follow me. And hopefully that, well, not hopefully, he knew that it would work for some people and other people still wouldn't care. But, but that's his final thing. Here, let me find someone who will listen to my voice, who will obey my voice. And he and his posterity, he and his children, will be that example to the rest of the world. Boy, if we follow God, this is what will happen. So I, I want to um, just read a little bit in chapter 10 
uh, because Noah had three kids. We followed uh, the Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And um, in Genesis chapter 10, because now we're going to follow just Shem's family. He said, here's Ham's family, and they're the Canaanites, and they became the Egyptians, and they became, uh, uh, they founded Nineveh and Babylon and, and Japheth's kids, and he was the youngest. They, they were eventually, they stayed up in the Caucasus Mountains for a long time, and then finally crossed over. They were late in developing, crossed over into Europe, and et, et cetera. But we want to follow the third child, the oldest, Shem. And that's who we're going to focus on. And that's who we focus on for the rest of the Bible is Shem and his, his descendants. So in Genesis chapter 10, verse 22 and 23, in Genesis chapter 10, verses 22 and 23, it says the children of Shem were Elam, Asher, Afaxad, Arphaxad, Woo! Lud, and Aram. Now, you would think those are black names, but... Um, so there, he had five kids, but only tells us about two of them because he Moses, who again compiled this book, is saying, really only two of his kids are we concerned with and their kids. The other kids, they did stuff, and who knows what happened to them. So he, first he takes the children of Aram, the youngest. Uh, in verse 23, it says, and the children of Aram were Uz and Hull and Gether and Mash. Now, He's pointing this out for a reason. Uh, Uz, I want you to remember that name, Uz, U-Z, because the, uh, he comes up, he, he, he later, we hear that name later in the Bible. So, yes, the children of Aram. So, but here's who we really want to associate with, and that's in verse 24 of Genesis chapter 10, and our uh, Faxad, woo! He begat Selah, and Selah begat Eber. And Eber's the guy, uh, later they called him Heber. And again, when, when, the, when the language was developed, and the Hebrews, and uh, the uh, Samaritans, and the, uh, uh, anyway, um, they started to put an H in front of Eber, which is Heber. And eventually this became the children of Heber, and eventually became just the Hebrew children. So he's, that's who we're following. Now, in Genesis chapter 11, verses uh, 10 through 26, this is after the Tower of Babel. So we're, we're going we're gonna to get to chapter 12, but first we've got to finish. What, here's what happened after the Babel. Uh, these are the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old, and he, he, he begat Arphaxad two years after the flood. That's the family we're following. And Shem lived after he begat Arphaxad. Glad I won't have to say that name anymore. 500 years and beget sons and daughters. And then in verse 12, our facts had lived five and 30 years and begat Selah. So he's starting to have kids at 35 years old. You won't remember this, but earlier on, they weren't having kids until they were in their hundreds. Now they're having kids when they're like 35. Okay, he begat Selah. And verse 14, and Selah lived 30 years and he begat Eber. So he, he, he started having kids when he was 30 years old. Eber lived four and 30 years, and he begat Peleg. So uh, at 34, he started to have kids. Wouldn't, wouldn't lie. Peleg lived 30 years and begat Ru. Ru lived two and 30 years and begat Sarag. And verse 22, it says, Sarag lived 30 years and begat Nahor. Now we're finally getting to, we say, who cares about all these people? Okay, Nahor is important. Uh, verse 22. 23 and uh, verse 24 and Nahor lived nine and 20 years and begat Terah so he's only 29 years old when he begets Terah okay and verse uh, 26 of Genesis chapter 11 Terah lived 70 years and begat Abram Nahor and Haran okay so we're going to park there for a second uh, so even though for like eight generations they started having kids in their 30s uh, for some reason, Terah was 70 years old when he begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now, for some reason, people think that Abraham was, Abram was the oldest, but he was not. <laughs> he was the youngest. Um, so Terah lived 70 years when he begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. I know normally they do it from the oldest to the youngest, but in this case, they did it from the youngest to the oldest. 
So we, he didn't beget them all three at the same time because that would hurt his wife. He was 70 and he begets Heron. Heron is the oldest son. He had him when he was 70. We can do some math to find out how old was he when he when Terah begat Abram, and it's kind of important. We'll see. Um, so in, in Acts chapter 7, verse 4, in Acts chapter 7, verse 4, Stephen is preaching about Abraham, and it says, Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans, and he dwelt in Haran. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed from this land, he removed and came to this land, sorry, where you now dwell. So when, when Abraham's father died, that's when Abraham finally came to Canaan land, which ultimately became called Israel. So he didn't leave to go there until his dad died. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 32, it says the days of Terah were 200 and five years, and then Terah died in Haran. So Terah Terra, uh, was 205 when he died. And we know that Abraham was 75. In fact, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 4, it says Abraham was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. So they, they lived in three places. They lived in the Ur of the Chaldees, then they moved to Haran, and then Abraham moved to the land of Canaan. So he was 75 when he left, and his dad was 205 when he died. And, and Abraham waited for his dad to die, and that's when he moved on. So if his dad was 205 and Abraham was 75, then his dad was 130 when he had him. Because 130 plus 75 is 205. So his dad was 130 when he had Abraham. However... He was 70 when he had Haran, so he had three sons. He was 70 years old when he had his first son, and he was 130, he was 60 years later when he had Abraham. So there's a 60 years difference in these kids. Why am I bringing that up? Because Haran was 60 years older than his youngest brother, and if he was anything like his grandfather, his great-grandfather, his great-great-grandfather, he might have started having kids when he was in his 30s. Or may not have had him till he was in his 60s. But still, Haran's kids were the same age as Abraham, or maybe even older. And I'm saying this because Abraham's nieces and nephews were his same age, or possibly even older than him. Um, and so when we hear this person married his uncle or his aunt, in, in this case, the aunt, they were the same age. Of course, you're saying that still doesn't justify marry your uncle and aunt. I, I get that. Okay, but there, but it's not like Abraham was seventy-five, and uh, and his niece was three, and they got married. Okay, so going back uh, to Genesis chapter eleven, so uh, verse twenty-seven through twenty-nine. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and then Haran begat Lot. We know about Lot, so that name's obviously familiar. Uh, so Haran started having kids, and his first child that he has is Lot. Again, his father's having kids for 60 years. So Lot and Abram were about the same age. About the, and Lot may have been older. We don't, we don't know. Uh, but Lot was not, not some sort of little kid. So Terah's got three sons, and that one son has, has one kid, Lot. And then in verse 28, it says, Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. So Haran died where he was born. He, he was born in, in Ur of the Chaldees. When it says he died before his father Terah, it doesn't, this phrase doesn't mean he died, he preceded him in death, although that's true. He died before him, like right in front of him. That's what the phrase means. He, uh, like Nimrod was sinning before God. And like, right, this phrase means right in his face. So Haran, Terah has three sons, Haran, Nahor, and Abraham. Haran has Lot, and then he has two more kids, and then he dies right in front of his father. They make a point. Um, so when that happened, um, it says in verse 29, Abraham and Nahor took them wives because they hadn't gotten married yet. Haran was the only one having kids. And the name of Abraham's wife was Sarah, Sarai, uh, with an A-I at the end. And the name of Nahor's wife 
Abraham's older brother, was Milcah, who was the daughter of Haran. So Milcah's marrying his aunt. But I, again, she's probably his same age. And the father, uh, so uh, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, Haran's the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. So they had one more, he had one more. Haran had three kids. He has Lot, he has uh, Milka, who became Abraham's brother's wife, and he had Iska, whose name means seer, and we never hear of her ever again. So I don't know what happened. Her name means seer, and maybe she could see what was going on. She's, I'm getting out of here. But she's never mentioned again. Now, huh, Nahor marries his aunt. This was kind of not a strange thing for a while. Uh, in, in Exodus chapter 6, verse 20, it says, Amran took him Jochebed, his father's sister, to wife, and she bare him Aaron and Moses. So Aaron and Moses, their father married their aunt. So their mother was also their great aunt. Or Anyway, uh, and the years of the life of Amram was 130 and seven years. So Moses came from the union where his father had married his father's sister. But God put an end to that once everyone, once they, oh, say, okay, so you're living in Egypt and you got Egyptian ways. I get it. Uh, but now that I've taken you out of Egypt, we're going to stop that. You don't have to do that anymore. Um, so what we're doing was part of the customs of the, of, well, one thing is they, they, they hated marrying outside of their lineage. Like, you're the people of Ham. We don't, don't marry them. They're crazy. Don't marry those Japheth kids. You got to stay in the family. So they're very into preserving their family line. So that's part of the reason why they did that. But God said, stop it. So in Leviticus chapter 18, Leviticus chapter 18, verse 12 through 14, God's now giving the law through Moses because the children of Israel have come out of Egypt. And they said, I know you did that while you're in Egypt, but don't do that anymore. So it says, thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's sister, because she is thy father's near kinswoman. And thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, for she is thy mother's near kinswoman. And thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's brother. Well, no. Thou shalt not approach his wife, for she is thine aunt. And so he, they, he starts saying, so we're going to stop that. You're, you're going to stop marrying your aunts and uncles. Uh, Genesis chapter 20, verse 11 through 12. Um, there are a lot, the reason I'm bringing this up, we're just skipping ahead for just a second, is because Abraham's brother married Milka, his aunt. Some people think that Abraham married his, the other daughter, Iska. But no, no. However, he did marry his stepsister. So in Genesis chapter 20, verse 11 and 12, remember Abraham is, is in Egypt. He's gone down to Egypt. And he tells Sarah, tell them you're my sister. Don't, because you're so beautiful. And if they think you're my wife, they'll kill me. But if they think you're a sister, they'll just take you, but they won't kill me. So he was very gallant. Like, I don't really care what happens to you. I just don't want to die. <laughs> Verse 11. And Abraham said, so that so so they sure enough, they do take her because she's beautiful, apparently. And uh, and then all sorts of hell breaks loose. And then Pharaoh comes to him. The, the Egyptian king comes to Abraham and said, why did you tell me this was Joe's uh, wife? And, and he says, because Abraham said, because I thought surely the, the fear of God is not in this place. Like you guys are crazy. You're Egyptian and you just kill people and, and they will and they will slay me for my wife's sake. You know, so you, I thought you were going to kill me. So and yet, indeed. She is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And then she became my wife. So Terah lost his first, the wife uh, that gave him Haran and Nahor and Abraham, those three sons. She passed away. So he married someone else and had another daughter, Sarai. So Abraham married his stepsister, his father's other daughter through a different mother um okay that's what they did in those days but god said quit it so he, and that's it so abraham married his stepsister and his brother married his aunt there you have it that uh yes exactly see well that happened so 
Genesis chapter 11, verse 30. However, it says, but Sarah was barren and had no child. This was a problem because uh, his brother, Nahor, he had eight kids. Uh, in Genesis chapter 22, they kind of, they list them. And again, we're going to be familiar with a couple things. Uh, Genesis chapter two, 22, verse 20 to 21, it says, and it came to pass after the after these things that it was told Abraham saying, behold, Milka, your sister-in-law, she has also born children unto thy brother Nahor. Huz, his firstborn, and Buzz, his brother, and Kimuel, who's the father of Aram. Now, Aram, they later just started calling Ram. Okay. Uh, and so there was Huz, Buzz, and Ram. Why are these names important and familiar to us? In, uh, in Job 1.1, Job 1.1, 1, 1, Job 1, 1. by the way, the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. They know that because the, the Hebrew that it was written in is, is, is more ancient than Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, uh, for example, if we found, if you look at Shakespeare, Shakespeare's writing, although we both speak English, we speak English today, he spoke English then, you could tell that's an older form. We don't speak like that anymore. If you go back uh, another century to, to an earlier writer, if you go back to Chaucer, mm. you say, we don't speak like that anymore. So you can, you can tell how old the language is. So comparatively, the Hebrew that Job was written in is a more ancient form of Hebrew than even Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy was written after Moses came out of Egypt, during probably during that 40 year period where they have nothing to do, no television sets, where they're wandering around the, the wilderness, that's when he, he wrote all of that and, and, put, and compiled it all together. So Job was written before that, sometime after Abraham, but before the children of Israel came out is when the book of Job was written. That's when the, those events happened. In Job 1.1, 1, 1, it says, there was a man in the land of Uz. So remember, Uz is one of, the, one of Shem's kids. So Job, now, the Shemites, who we're assuming were kind of half godly, because uh, they, they mentioned Peleg, who, uh, who was born in the days of Nimrod, and they mentioned him specifically, and his name means, and again, either he went along with Nimrod and caused the division, or he was the one prophesying, saying, this is going to cause division. It's going to cause division. And they just started calling him division. Uh, so we think somehow Shem's line was a little more godly than the other ones. So uh, Job lived in the land of Uz. Job was a Shemite from that same line of, as Abraham. Uh, who, and his name, okay, whose name was Job. And the man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. Uh, I'm bringing this up because uh, Job, the first thing it tells us about Job is that he was blameless, he was upright, he shunned evil, and then a bunch of bad stuff happens to him. The reason they tell us in the very beginning, this man was blameless is so that we know he didn't do anything to deserve what happened next. And some people will teach, well, if you love God, and then nothing bad will ever happen to you. And if you go against God, then that's why bad things are happening to you. And that's not always true. Uh, Job was blameless, upright before God. He feared God. He shunned evil. And yet all these bad things happened to him. And Job continued just to bless God. In fact, the devil came and said, the only reason he likes you is because all this good stuff is happening to you. If, if bad stuff started to happen to you, he'd cuss you. Well, is that true of our, any of us as Christians today? Or do we follow God just because of all the good things and all the goodies we get? Our church is packed today. Our, our, our mega, I don't pick a mega church. It could be any kind of church. Are they packed because people are saying, God's going to bless you. And he is. God is going to bless us. But if that's all you preach, if you don't preach the full gospel, it sounds like, you know, Come to, come to Jesus, be a Christian, and you get a new car, you get a new television set, and you get a car, and you get a car, and you, you know, and, and so people tend to come to God for, we have to be careful what we're preaching, mm -hmm. because we need to preach, come to God because he's God, and because you're evil, and you need to repent before him, first repent, because he created the heavens and the earth, and because his is the, you know, belief in him is the only way to salvation, not come to God, and he will give you things. And 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 so and that's what the devil was saying about Job. He only serves you because of, look, you you blessed him. If you lost everything today, 
the devil's asking us, would you still love God if, if suddenly this happened and that happened? It, or, or do we get confused and, oh no, bad stuff's happening. God's abandoned me. And uh, Job said, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. I'm not going to let go. And he was cool. He was cool until his friends came and said, you must have done something wrong. His three friends showed up and said, I know you did something. You did bad stuff wouldn't happen to you unless you did something wrong. Because, you know, if you love God, only good things happen. And, and Joe kept saying, no, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. Well, they said, somebody's at fault. And then here's where Job slipped up. He said, well, God must be at fault. Because uh, I know I didn't do nothing wrong. That's when Elihu shows up. And, and, and I just want to point out Elihu for just one reason. Job chapter 32, verse 2. Uh, it says uh, in Job chapter 32, verse 2. So these three men ceased answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. So they were fighting with him and arguing with him, but then Job said, no, I did nothing wrong. It must be God who messed up. If you're going to choose a villain, it was God. So Elijah, it says, then, then verse 2, Elihu shows up. He's the fourth friend. Then the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barachel, the Buzzite of the family of Ram, was aroused against Job his wrath was aroused because he justified himself rather than God. So Elihu was from the family of Buzz. Remember that Nahor, Abraham's brother, had three kids, had three sons at first, Huz and Buzz and Ram. So it says Elihu was a Buzzite and, and of the family of Ram from that. And somewhere the Rams and the Buzzites must have got together and just formed one tribe. Uh, and so, but he comes up and he's angry because you're justifying yourself instead of God. You're saying God's wrong. And, and then God shows up and says, I'm not wrong. I, I, what's wrong with you, crazy? Everything I do is right. So if this bad stuff's happening to you, just because you can't figure out why it's happening, that doesn't mean I made a mistake or I messed up and, you know, and Job went, ooh, you're right. I should shut up. And then he did. <laughs> and so, and then God blessed him. And we got to remember that what happened to Job was a week's worth of really bad stuff. But then God blessed him and he had twice as much as he had before. A lot of people way a long time ago in the church were using Job as an excuse to always be suffering, to always be going through bad stuff. Well, you know, Job suffered. And, <laughs> and the Bible says, examine yourself because you shouldn't always be going through bad stuff every single day that Job went through bad stuff for a week. So if bad stuff has continually happened to you time after time after time after time after time, then you might have to examine your ways, the Bible says, and see, maybe I'm doing something wrong. Job wasn't doing anything wrong. But he only had a week's worth of bad stuff. Um, but, the, but so people were using Job as an excuse to justify a lot of bad stuff happening that they were causing. Well, Job suffered. And so then the church decided to go way the other way and say, only good things should ever happen to you. And then they became like, like uh, Job's friends and said, and tried to find out what Job did wrong. I mean, I heard sermon after sermon after sermon of what Job did wrong. Well, you know, Job, he uh, sacrificed for his, to, you know, for his friends. So he was living in fear. And that's why this happened. And, blah, blah, blah. and none of that, the Bible is clear that Job did not sin. It says, it says it specifically, Job did not sin. So uh, we don't need to go the other way and say, only good things are going to ever happen to you if you love God, because that's not true. But sometimes when a bad thing happens, it doesn't mean you did something wrong. You don't have to beat yourself. You don't have to. You just go to God and say, well, Lord, I don't know why this is happening, but I know you're the deliverer. I know you're going to come through, and I know this has a purpose, and I know that you're going to change things around. So I'm not going to sit here and depressed and beat myself and, cause, and, and think you've abandoned me. You haven't. You haven't. God never abandons us. So uh, I just took that excursion because I saw Nahor's kids and Huz and Buzz and their, um, their great uncle, Ur, uh, Uz, Uz, right? And uh, that reminded me of Job living in the land of Uz and, and Elihu was a descendant of Buzz. Okay, so uh, back to Genesis chapter 22. So his name, and then we'll get back to 12. Um, so Abraham's brother had eight kids, Abraham didn't have any. And this is the first time we hear this, because you know, everybody had bunches of kids, so it was, Abraham's a real anomaly. Here's some more kids of his, of his brother, uh, and just after 22, verse 22 through 23, it says, 
these are more kids. He had Chesed and Hazo and Pildash and Jid Thaf. Oh my God. And Bethuel. Oh, thank God for Bethuel. And Bethuel begat Rebecca. So he had five more kids. The eighth one was Bethuel. Bethuel begat Rebecca. And the reason Rebecca is, is important is because when Abraham finally did have a son, Abraham Isaac, he sent him to scout out uh, his his older brother's kids, and and they found Rebecca, and then and so Isaac is basically marrying his cousin, but that's okay. At least it wasn't his auntie. All right, back to Genesis eleven, chapter thirty one. So Terah's got uh, only two sons left. His oldest son has died, but his oldest son had three kids. Iska, we don't know what happened to her. She ran off. <coughs> Lot and Milka, and the oldest brother took Milka and left. So Taryn basically has Abraham and his wife, and they're barren, and Lot. So Terra in, in Genesis chapter 11, verse 31, it says, and Terah took Abraham, Abram, sorry, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abraham's wife, and they went forth with them from the Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, but they came to Haran and dwelt there. So they ultimately were going to go to the land of Canaan. Well, that's 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 how Moses is saying it. They didn't know that's where they were going to end up. Abraham didn't know that was going to, where he was going to end up. He's taking them to Haran, which is up in Syria. So their fam, the Shemites started up. So they're down in the Mesopotamian Valley, uh, in in the south, and they and 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 in Samaria. And a lot of people were in Samaria. It was a big city, and uh, and a lot of tribes and a lot of people went there. Um, and they went from the Earth Chaldees. They, they go up way north, and they're avoiding the desert, and they're up in Haran, which is in Syria, and they went to their ancestral home. And that's where they planned on staying. So even though it says, and then they went to Canaan, they don't know they're going to go to Canaan. They're, they've settled there because they're like, let's get away from this big city. Um, if you just study history, Sumer had been overrun with a lot of warfare and, and a lot of bad stuff was going on. And there was a massive migration out of there, actually. And so just as part of that migration, uh, Abraham, Abram's dad takes he his nephew Lot and his wife, and, and they go up to their ancestral home and, and they're living there. So Genesis chapter 11, verse 32, in the days of Terah were 205 years old, I mean 205 years, and then Terah died in Haran. So Abraham has his wife and his nephew and they're living in Haran. And there is something happens when, so, so he, his, his mother has died, his father has died, um, we're assuming the second mother of, of, of Sarah's mother also has died. Um, and so it's just Abraham and Sarah and Lot living in Haran. They didn't know anybody there, even though this is their ancestor home where the Shemites uh, had settled for a long time. He's just there trying to figure out what next to do with his life. He's ripe for God to come in. God often will come in when there's been a, a big change in your life. Sometimes if a parent has passed away or you're about to move or some, some uh, you lose your job, that's a time for reflection. Okay, Lord, what does this all mean? I can sense a transition. The next thing's about to happen. What? And that's the time to seek God as opposed to just running willy-nilly. Like, let me just be in prayer and see what where we bring led. So in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, we're finally there. Um. Let me see. I'm just running off the mouth. Now the Lord has said to Abram, get thee out of thy country and from my kindred and from my father's house. So I need you to get away from there and, I, and I'm going to send you someplace else. Here's the problem with what was going on in his father's house. We know that uh, from further scripture that his father was a polytheist, worshipped a bunch of different gods, uh, the, the Shemites were a, a bunch of different gods. It's so interesting because it's not, we're not that far removed from uh, the Tower of Babel, not that far removed from the flood, but people were so quick 
just to turn on God and do their own thing. Well, that's how we are. That's how we are. God can, people get in a car accident, almost get killed, and, and God saves them miraculously. And for like three days, they are so religious. And then we just forget about it and go back to our own thing. You know, Lord, if you just will save my mama, or Lord, if you just will pay this bill. And then God comes through, and then it just takes about a month, and we're back to our old ways. Yeah, bye-bye. It was fun. So, um, so we know that his father worshiped the gods. For example, when Abraham's, Abraham, Isaac, Jake, grandson, Jacob, uh, had gone and visited his cousins, and that's where he married Rachel and Leah and all that stuff, He's right? Uh, then he gets in trouble, and he's on the run. Um, he, uh, he leaves this cousin. This is Nahor's family, right? Abraham's brother's family. And, and then the, and Laban goes chasing him, his, his, his uncle. And, and he says, um, he catches him and says in Genesis chapter 31, verse 29, it is in my power to do you harm, but the God of your father spoke to me last night. And he means that specifically because you worship some God that came and spoke to your father, but I have these other gods. But he spoke to me last night saying, be careful that you speak uh, to Jacob, neither good nor bad, like just stay neutral. Zip. And now you have surely gone because you greatly long for your father's house. So you're trying to get back to where Abraham lives and Isaac and all, all that. But why did you steal my gods, he says. And now he actually didn't steal them. Rebecca, uh, Rachel stole them uh, because they have gods and they don't go anywhere. Nahor, that whole side of Abraham's family, you carried your gods with you. It was very convenient. We carry our gods with us too in our phones, you know, and oh good. Anything I need to know, it's right here. I could pray, but it's faster just to Google it. So uh, they carried their gods with them. And Siri. yes, yeah, Siri, uh, what's the other, Alexa? Uh, Turn on my television, Alexa. So we just like having gods around us that we can, hey, Siri, what's the answer to this? You know, echo. I'm Ethel, Ethel? Echo. Oh, Echo, see? I'm sorry. I'm going to name one Ethel and Bent one and Lucy. And then, you, and then you never know what they're going to do. Geneva. Uh, okay, anyway, just we just we just love it, right? Because we can ask them questions because we want instant answers. And the, the God that we serve, the God who's the only God, he won't answer you right away sometimes. And so we want instant answers. So we just invent our own gods. And so they just carried their gods with them. Uh, in Joshua chapter 24, verse 2, it says, and Joshua says unto all the people, Joshua 24, verse 2, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. So, so Terah, Nahor, the, Abraham's daddy served God. So, the, so I just want to get this picture of Abraham growing up in a situation where even though they knew about God, they had all created their own. And this is what, this was rampant after Nimrod, that people would just worship and serve the make up gods that they served. So he tells, so God appears to Abraham and says, I want you to go to a land in, in, in Genesis chapter 12, verse one, that I will show you. So you just, you just need to start walking and he doesn't know where he's going. Uh, and, and so, um, uh, and he, that's why in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, in Hebrews 11, 8, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after, which he should after receive for an inheritance. Like, I go to the place, and then after, after you get there, then I'll give it to you. He obeyed, and he went out, not knowing where he was going. And that's, you have to really have trust. Uh, if God spoke to you today, and you said, just, just leave your house and just start walking. And when you get there, I'll tell you where you are. I'm like what? And 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 don't you're not coming back. Just pack everything up and just go, like kung fu. Just walk the earth, and uh, that's a very old reference from the seventies. And in fact, in Isaiah, Isaiah fifty one two, it says, "Look to Abraham your father and Sarah who bore you, for I called him alone and blessed him and increased him." It doesn't mean alone without Sarah, but uh, he he was the only one of his kind. Everyone around him was worshiping gods, and and he says, "Be like him." Um, and so here's the promises that he makes him. He says, I will make you a great nation. Now, Abraham has no kids, obviously. So that's alluring. Like if you just get up and start walking, just get up and start going. 
then I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you and give you success. In this way, he doesn't mean wealth, although Abraham did end up a wealthy person. Uh, if we follow after God, then then everywhere we step will be a success. It doesn't mean we'll be filthy rich. It just means it will work for our good. It will work out for us. If you're following God, you'll make decisions today and they will work out. You'll be, they'll be successful. He says, I'll make your name great. You'll be remembered and thou shalt be a blessing. That means your life will have a positive impact on other people. And I will bless them that bless you. So here he becomes the dividing line. People who agree with your faith, people who say, oh, Oh, he just believes in one God. He just believes in the God. People who agree with that and, and listen to you and take that in, and to, I, they'll be blessed. But people who, he says, I'll curse them to curse you. Uh, and actually, there's two different words for curse there, even though they're in the same sentence. But he's it's, it's basically saying, those who mock you, I'll pass a sentence on them of failure. Uh, those were those two words, curse me. And I'll curse them to curse you, but there's two different words for curse. Um, and, and that's still true today. Those who mock Abraham's faith, those who say, oh, that God of the Bible, he's it, then they ultimately will fail in, in what they attempt to do. And it says, and it shall be, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. You'll be a, bless, you'll be a blessing, and, and how I bless you will affect every family. Not every member of every family, but there'll be somebody in every family of the earth who gets blessed because of you. Some, some member of that family, somewhere along the line, every family on earth will have someone who's going to believe in your same God. So here's the, here's the, the purpose, as, as I'm shutting down, um, is, there, now my computer's plugged in. Okay, so here's the purpose. Uh, remember I was saying earlier that as a good teacher, you want to show all the benefits, uh, like here's all the things you can learn and here's all the things you can have if you study. And, and here's the consequences of not studying. Um, and, and here's how it won't work out all the time that you're in this class. If you're doing things your way and you're not listening, it's going to be frustrating. But as the ultimate incentive, I'm, I'm going to ch choose, I'm going to bring in someone that truly I have molded that listen to everything that I said, and you can see the success and the anointing on their life, and hopefully that will f inspire you to say, I want that. I can see now the benefits. I can see physically the benefits. And, and listen, that's why we read reviews online. We want to know people who've tested that product and driven that car or eaten that food or gone to that restaurant. And, and I want a real person just like me to see what happened when you used that product? Did it work for you? Did your hair grow back or whatever, you know? And so I'm going to choose someone. That's why he chose Abraham, just an average normal guy. And I'm going to bless him and his family line so people can see a nation. Here's what happens when a people, a family, a person, a nation follows after me. And so that other, he's, he says, I'm going to make the other nations of the world jealous. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 2. It says, he says to the, to the Jews uh, as they're coming out of Egypt, you are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be people for himself, a special treasure above all the people who are on the face of the earth. In, in Isaiah 43.10, it says, you, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servants whom I have chosen. Uh, so, and he's saying, you're my witness. I, I, I'm going to anoint you. I'm going to bless you and teach you to follow after my ways. And you'll be my witnesses. People will see how I pervert, preserve the nation of Israel. And all those times they could have been destroyed and all the times the enemies have come against. But I blessed them. I, I blessed the Jewish people. And people will be able to see that. And they'll be jealous and angry. But you'll be witnesses of what it's like for people who, who serve the living God. So I, he says, I, you, the, you are my servant, so I've chosen that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he, and before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. So I, I want a people who understand that I'm the only God, even though they're going to worship all these other gods. I'm going to choose a people, and if they will follow my word, because he always says, you know, if you don't follow my word, then not good stuff's going to happen. But if you will do what I'll say, then I'll make you an example of all the people on the earth. And there are people who are just jealous of the Jews, which is just makes me crazy. Well, and, and that's to their own detriment, because God's just going to punish them. Because those are, it's like, leave the Jews alone. They're God's chosen people. Leave them alone. Uh, and, but we can get that same blessing of Abraham if we follow after him. 
uh, in Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, it says, you'll be to me a kingdom of priests, a kingdom of priests. Now, the priest goes into the temple, goes before God on behalf of the sinners. He says, I want to make, I'll make a kingdom of priests. All of you will be people who are able to go before me on behalf of a sinful world and pray for them. Um, and indeed, in, in chapter 49, 6, he says, is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel? I will also give you as a light to the nations, to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. So I'm making you the light. I'm going to choose you, Abraham, and make you a, a, a mighty nation from you. And if we hook onto that same thing, that same God, then people will look at us. Not that nothing bad ever happens to us. We know that a bunch of bad stuff happened to the nation of Israel, but that God just continually rescues us and blesses us and gives us knowledge and gives us wisdom. People should be able to look at us and go, there's something different about those people. They serve the living God because look, this they should have been killed from that car accident, but look how God saved them. And this should and but look how God is blessing. And 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 that situation came, but look how God came in. And look at their faith. Look how they're just constantly trusting. They're not worried. They're not upset. They're always praising God. When you put them in prison, they're singing songs. And, they, you know, and, and so that was the whole purpose. I wanted people so I can show off of the benefits of taking this class. Take this class and you study. Look what can happen to you. This can happen to you. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse, seven, verse 5 and 7, verse 5 through 7. Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me. This is Moses talking to the people. That you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. So I've taught you, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, so that you can act that way once you go into Canaan. Once you go into that land, you'll be living that word that's been taught to you. So therefore, be careful to observe them. For, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes. So they're gonna, people are going to be watching you, and this is going to be your wisdom. These statutes that I'm teaching you are going to be what preserves you. And they will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near it as the Lord our God is to us? For whatever reason, we may call upon him. So who has a God like our God? No one. There's no God like our God because there's no other God who's so near us when we call on him. And people, sinners, non-believers should be calling you up and say, oh, no, this terrible thing just happened. And I'm, I'm going to call. Will you please pray? Because they know that you pray. They should know you have a connection to God. And when some horrible thing happens, people should be calling us up. Will you pray to your God? And because they, they can see our faith and they know that we are people who pray and have a God who's near who answers prayer. So this is what he's pressing Abraham. And in verse 4, this is my final verse. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him, and Abraham was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. So Abraham's on his way to Canaan, trusting this God who's made these promises. I will make you a great nation, and there'll be all these benefits, but I'm going to use you as an example for the world. And this is God's strategy from then on. That's the whole purpose of the children of Israel all throughout the rest, all the way to the book of Revelation. God is saying, I want a people who I've chosen, who I'm going to bless who I'm going to lead and to guide. I'm going to preserve and protect these people if they follow my commandments. And they'll be the light to the rest of the world. They'll make the rest of the world jealous. And they'll say, I want that God. So this is his final way to get people to choose him. We were in the Garden of Eden. And he says, you have a thousand trees to choose or that one. And we were stupid. Uh, before the flood, hey, stop sinning. I'm going to flood the earth. But we were stupid. Tower of Babel, quit doing that. And then we, we, we were stupid. So he says, finally, I'm going to give you Abraham. I'm going to give you a nation of people who, who you can see what happens to them, to people who follow after me. And, and so you, now you have no excuse because I, I will choose a, a special nation. And, and he's saying that to us today as, as Christians. I, I'm going to choose you and I will bless you so that you can be a light, so that people can see what, it happens, what happens when you follow after the living God. So we want to be that light, continue to be that light in the world. So thank you for, for tuning in this Sunday. And I'll see some of you uh, next Sunday, some of you Wednesday at 7 o'clock for my Bible study. And those who are members of Good Shepherd, don't forget to stay on to listen to Pastor Grimm. He's on our the, the Good Shepherd Facebook page, or you can go to his page and listen to him. Uh, amen. God bless you. In video.